Hey runners, just another running coach here and welcome to part two of my guide on running footwear. If you missed the first part, I hope you'll go back and check it out. We took a look at the anatomy of a running shoe and broke down the categories of price range, amount of cushion, and neutral versus stability. In the second part, we're gonna take that knowledge and add a little bit of make-believe and I'm gonna walk you step by step through the process of actually going to the store, trying on different pairs and how to determine the best pair or pairs for your needs. At the end, I'm also going to give you some quick tips on how to take good care of your shoes and when to replace them. Just like in the last video, I wanna put up a quick disclaimer saying that I'm not currently sponsored by any running shoe companies or running stores. And any products or pieces of advice that I mention are coming only from me not from anyone else. I will add this time that I did used to work at my local running store. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Uh, so a lot of the advice I'll be giving in this video is based off of my experiences as both a runner and a former salesperson. Starting off with step number one, go to the running store. I'm not trying to be funny. This is a really important step. When I worked at my store, I processed so, so many online returns, and it was almost always because the runner had ordered the wrong type of shoe for them, a shoe they never tried on before, or they just ordered the wrong size. Yes, it is so much easier to shop online these days, especially if you're busy or you feel uncomfortable in retail stores, which I totally understand. And yes, it's hard to resist a hot sale online that you can't get in store, but to be perfectly blunt with you, unless you're buying a fresh pair of a shoe you've already worn, it's a total crapshoot, and you and your feet deserve way better. By going to the store, yes, you may get a little extra encouragement to buy the brand of the month or take advantage of a deal you didn't even know you wanted, but you're gonna be able to try on the shoes, figure out the right size, put them to the test on the treadmill, and most importantly, get a closer look at all those beautiful color options. Plus, as I mentioned in the last video, most running stores offer a free gait analysis, which can help you figure out if you really should be trying on stability shoes, the importance of which cannot be understated. Step two, know where to start. When you walk into the store, you'll hopefully be greeted by a very kind salesperson who will ask how they can help you. If it's very busy and nobody approaches you and you feel that you need someone's full attention, don't be afraid to turn around or ask if the store has a reservation system. Assuming you do find help, you'll want to be able to give them enough information about yourself as a runner and what you think you might be looking for. This part does take a little self-reflection and it's where you'll want to use some of the knowledge from the first video. For example, let's say my name is Runner A. I'm a brand new runner and I just want to be able to safely and comfortably run three times per week. My budget's around $150 and I'm not sure what shoes or brands to try on, but I think I need something with a lot of cushioning to protect my joints while I adapt to the high impact. Now, this is a very good amount of information to start with and it'll help the salesperson know to only bring up shoes you're actually interested in. If you go in without any place to start from, it is possible you'll get there eventually, but it will take more trial and error, and it does open up the possibility that you'll be trying on shoes that aren't really what you need. Step three, get analyzed. If I'm runner A, and this is my first time ever at the running store, I'm gonna wanna make sure I ask my salesperson for a gait analysis before they bring any shoes for me to try on. For those who are unfamiliar, a gait analysis is when someone watches you run, usually on a treadmill, for about 10 seconds, super quick, and determines whether or not your ankles pronate naturally, overpronate, or supinate. This is a really important step because if I overpronate, I need to be trying on high cushion stability shoes, not high cushion neutral shoes. But if we never find out that's what I need, I could end up buying a neutral shoe and run into trouble, literally. Step four, find the right size. Before you can try on anything, of course, the salesperson will either need to measure your feet or ask for your shoe size. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up. I apologize again for the run puns. The rule of thumb here, and I really mean this in the most literal sense, is that you're gonna want thumb's width of space between your longest toe and the front of the shoe. Not half a thumb, not the very tip of your thumb, the whole width of your thumbnail. Yes, this means you're almost always going to be a bigger size than you think you are, 
but please, please, for the love of your precious toenails, please swallow your pride and do not try to fit into a size that's too small. If your toes are snug up against the front wall you're not running, it's too small. If you can see the outline of your toes through the upper, it's too small. The reason why we want to leave a little space is because as we run, our feet tend to swell up a little bit. Many runners learn this the hard way and it's not fun. I'll give you a perfect example. A few years ago, I ran the New York City Marathon in a new shoe that was a half size too small for me. And not only was the last 10K excruciatingly painful, it took me almost an entire year for my big toenail to heal. So yeah, not fun. On the other hand, I don't want you to panic and buy shoes that are way too big for you. You don't want to be sliding around in your shoes or slipping out of the heel either. So really try to stick to the rule of thumb, no more, no less. And one final tip, if you feel like your heel is always falling out, try to avoid leaning forward or sliding your foot to the front of the shoe while tying them. You can tie them as tight as humanly possible, but if there's space in the back of the shoe when you tie them, your heel will never be secure. It'll just slide back and then you'll have a bunch of empty space. Instead, make sure your heel is square against the heel counter when you tie your shoes and that should do the trick. So now that we did all of that, it's finally time to try on some shoes. Most stores are gonna give you three comparable options from three different brands so you can get a little taste of everything. For example, if the gait analysis showed that runner A needs stability shoes, then runner A is gonna be trying on three different brands of high cushion stability shoes. If they were also open to trying medium cushion shoes, by the way, they might ask for two of the three options to be a medium and a high cushion from the same brand so they can compare the difference in feeling between the two levels of cushion. Either way, you're gonna to wanna to put them on your feet, make sure they're all the right size, and put them to the test. I recommend walking around a bit and then running for about 30 seconds on the treadmill if you're allowed. It seems like a pretty straightforward process, but you'd be surprised how tricky it can be sometimes to choose a winner. Here's some advice. First, don't judge a book by its cover. If a salesperson shows you a shoe on display and you don't like the look of it or the color and you don't give it a chance, you're potentially missing out on a great fit. Plus, there are probably other colors available and you could learn something even if you don't like the shoe, you could learn something from trying it on. On a similar note, if a shoe feels weird when you first put it on, I would still give it a few seconds of running on the treadmill because a lot of these shoes feel different when they're in action. You might be pleasantly surprised. That being said, if a shoe feels uncomfortable while you're running, don't sweat it, just set it aside and move on to the next pair. If it's a close tie between two pairs and they both feel comfortable, you really can't go wrong. Go with one and see how it goes. And if none of them feel good, don't feel like you have to choose the least uncomfortable. There should be more options the salesperson can bring you. One last thing at the risk of being redundant here is to try not to let fashion overrule function. There are definitely going to be times when you prefer the color or silhouette or brand name of one shoe over another, but I can tell you from experience, unless you do all of your running on a squeaky clean treadmill, they're all going to look dirty and beat up eventually, and chances are you're not going to be wearing them down the runway. If you really have to be picky and your favorite color of your favorite shoe is unavailable at your location, See if your salesperson can check the inventory of other locations and if they can put it on hold there or ship it to you. That just leaves one more step and that's step six. Buy the shoes, congratulations. Before we jump into the last part of this video, I wanna go through a few more types of runners with different needs and give some advice on how these runners might want to approach things. To quickly summarize runner A, we said that runner A was a brand new runner who was just trying to safely run three times per week with a budget of $150. Since this runner is new and the gait analysis showed that they overpronate, they're gonna wanna try on some high cushion stability shoes. Now let's talk about runner B. Runner B is an experienced runner. They just ran their first marathon and it was tough, but they had a lot of fun and they not only wanna do it again, but they wanna run it even faster. They did all of their training in the same pair of high cushion neutral shoes and they did the race in those shoes because that's what they were comfortable with. Because their new goal is very important to them, they're willing to spend a little extra this time, maybe something in the ballpark of $250. They're feeling pretty tempted to shout out the big bucks for a pair of those sweet carbon fiber racing shoes, 
But I'm gonna suggest that instead, runner B takes that budget and buys two pairs of shoes. A fresh high cushion pair to do easy pace mileage and a light cushion pair to handle the speed workouts and the race. This way, runner B can get the most life out of both shoes by having them share the workload and they can really nail those speed workouts without the heavier shoes dragging them along. The carbon fiber shoes are definitely enticing, but until runner B feels like they've run a few more marathons and hit a plateau, they're going to make a lot more progress by focusing on developing speed throughout the training program and not just relying on the shoes to make them faster on race day. Up next, we have runner C. Runner C loves to run on trails. They know they can wear neutral shoes, they just need a good pair of trail shoes that they can run in. And here's the good news to all my trail lovers out there. All of the same rules apply to trail shoes. I'm speaking to you from New York City, so obviously not a lot of trail action in the immediate area, but if you like to travel or you wanna train for a trail race, you're gonna to wanna to seek out a pair of trail shoes, and most running stores carry at least a few good options. All right, last but not least, Runner D. Let's say last year Runner D got their first pair of shoes. They were medium cushion stability shoes and they were really happy with them. But after a year of running, they're a little worn out and Runner D's joints are starting to feel a little more beat up than usual. So it's time to, you know what, lace them and replace them. They'd really like to buy the new model of the shoe they were running in, but times are tough and they can't really afford a full price shoe at the moment. I mentioned this briefly in the last video, but because shoes get updated models every year, what Runner D is gonna to wanna to do is see if there are any pairs of the old model still in stock, because they should be able to get a really good deal. Plus, Runner D already knows this model worked well for them because it's the same model they've been running in. And since it's only one model old, the midsole foam should still function as intended. By the way, runners A, B, and C could get away with doing the same thing and save a little money in the process. All right, so whether you're runner A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, finally, now that you have your shoes, what you're gonna wanna do at this point is get the most mileage out of them, AKA get the most bang for your buck. So I'm gonna do a quick lightning round of tips to help you with that. In general, you're gonna wanna store your shoes like you would anything valuable, ideally in a cool, dry environment and away from direct sunlight. This helps to preserve the midsole foam for as long as possible. For cleaning, running shoes should be cleaned by hand. You can do this with a moist paper towel or wipes, or if you're willing to get down and dirty, you can scrub your shoes with a shoe brush or a toothbrush and a little hand soap. To dry them out, you're gonna to wanna to grab some newspaper, believe it or not, and stuff it inside the shoes. This does work. And because newspaper also absorbs odors, it'll also help eliminate all that lovely stinkiness. What you definitely don't wanna do is put your shoes in the washer dryer. Running shoes are not built to interact with the chemicals found in most laundry detergents. And with the hot water and the pressure being tossed around in there, even if they come out of the machine looking okay, it's actually slowly disintegrating the adhesives and stitching that keep the shoe together. And it's actually possible that the shoes will get their revenge by breaking your machine. So try not to start a revenge drama in your laundry room, please. This next rule is probably the most obvious, but it's always worth saying, it's really important for the longevity and supportiveness of your running shoes that you only wear them while you're running. This is not just a rule for hardcore runners. In fact, I think it's especially important for new runners because if you spend a lot of time walking around or doing other activities in your running shoes, you're compressing that midsole and you're actually gonna underestimate how many miles you've put on the shoes before you consider replacing them. And that would be really bad because those last hundred or so miles you think you have in the shoes might actually be an extra hundred and you could get hurt. On that note, my last tip for the day is about when to replace the shoes. Personally, I like to replace my shoes when I either hit a certain mileage on them or when I start to feel like they're not as supportive as they used to be. The feeling thing does take a little experience and reference point to be able to rely on, but if you're really not sure, I would be more conservative if we're talking about light cushion or stability shoes and a little more lenient with high cushion or neutral shoes. 
If I had to throw a ballpark number out there, I would say almost any shoe is going to be good for at least 300 miles, with the lone exception of the carbon fiber racing shoes that are out there. 300 is probably going to sound a little low to some people watching this, but you really have to take a lot into consideration, like the surface you're running on and how hard you're running in the shoe. If you're running really softly on dirt or on a treadmill, you can probably squeeze another 100, 150 miles out of them, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. As for an expiration date, there's not really a set expiration date on shoes, but as I've said before, by the time a shoe is two versions old, even if you never took them out of the box, it's probably better to use them as comfy walking shoes. Well, if you're still here, thanks for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed this guide and I hope you find it helpful in all your running shoe pursuits. As always, feel free to share this video with any runners you think could use the info. And if you have questions, any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out. Until next time, happy running.